Chapter 2 The Indian Recognized One of the ways of avoiding the problem of Mexico's Indian identity has been to ideologically convert one sector of the national population into the repository of the remnants that, in spite of everything, admittedly remain from that foreign past. The Indians, generically labeled, thus resolve the absurdity of a civilization declared defunct by decree. What remains of all that was? Only this, the Indians. And in fact, they are here. In the Indian regions of the country they are recognized through external evidence. The clothes they wear, the dialect they speak, the appearance of their huts, their fiestas, and customs. Nevertheless, we Mexicans in general know little about our Indians. How many are there? How many different peoples compose that diverse ethnic mosaic that the colonizers lumped under the single term Indian, that is, those who were defeated and colonized? How many indigenous languages are spoken? These cold facts are difficult to specify precisely, a situation that, in itself, is symptomatic of the problem. But the real problem lies in the fact that rejection of that which is Indian makes it impossible to understand different and alternative ways of life. Very few people care to understand what it means to be Indian, to share the life and the culture of an Indian community, suffer its troubles, and delight in its pleasures. The Indian is viewed through the lens of an easy prejudice. The lazy Indian, primitive, ignorant, perhaps picturesque but always the dead weight that keeps us from being the country we should have been. What it means to be Indian It is not possible to give a precise figure for the number of Mexicans who consider themselves members of an indigenous group, that is, those who assume a particular ethnic identity and consider themselves collectively members of an us who are different from the others. In Mexico, there is no legal definition of what it means to be Indian. Such a definition would at least provide a formal way of estimating numbers. Instead, we are all equal here, although there are also Indians. The census data record only one piece of information, which is pertinent but by no means sufficient. The population five years old and above who speak an indigenous language. The census of 1980 recorded a total of 5,181,038 such individuals, of whom 3,699,653 also speak Spanish. These data, and those from previous censuses, have been criticized frequently and thrown into doubt. A statistical ethnocide, that is, a substantial reduction in the real figures caused by insufficient and defective data collection has even been suggested. It is well known that many people who speak an indigenous language as their maternal tongue hide and deny that fact. These problems carry us back to the colonial situation, to prohibited identities and proscribed languages, to the final accomplishment of colonization, when the colonized finally accepted internally the inferiority that the colonizers attributed to them, renounced their own identity, and assumed another and different one. Add to this, in many cases, the attitude of quote-unquote progressive local authorities, anxious to prove at any price that here in this village there are no more Indians, or at least there are fewer. We have become cultured people, or gente de razón, Nevertheless, apart from purifying the census figures, the problem consists in the fact that speaking an indigenous language, although an important fact, does not mean that all the speakers and only the speakers of indigenous languages constitute the total Indian population. The problem is not of a linguistic nature, although certainly language plays a role of great importance. Rather, it is social and cultural elements that determine membership in a specific cultural group. It is useful, then, to try to characterize Indian groups or peoples, and on this basis, to try to estimate how many Indians there are in Mexico. Indian peoples, like all others at any time or place in history, have their own peculiar history. Throughout the often ancient history, each generation transmits a heritage, its culture, to the next. Culture includes many diverse elements, 
objects and material goods considered as property, a territory and the natural resources it contains, habitations, public spaces and buildings, productive and ceremonial installations, sacred sites, the place where our dead ancestors are buried, instruments of work and of daily life. In sum, all the material repertoire that has been invented or adopted through time and that we consider ours as belonging to the Maya or the Tarahumara or the Miche. Also transmitted as a part of the cultural heritage are the forms of social organization. What rights and responsibilities individuals have as members of families, communities, and cultural groups as a whole. How to solicit the collaboration of others and to repay it. To whom to turn for orientation, decision making, or help. All this leads to another area, inherited knowledge. We learn how to do things, to do the kind of work that is done here, to interpret the natural world and its expressions, to find ways of confronting problems, to name things. Along with this, we also receive values, what is right and wrong, what is desirable and what is not, what is permitted and what is forbidden, what should be, the relative value of all acts and things. One generation transmits to those that follow the codes that allow communication and mutual understanding. It transmits a particular language that expresses the vision of the world and the ideas created by the group throughout its history. Also transmitted are particular gestures, tones of voice, ways of looking, and attitudes that have meaning for us and often for us alone. At a deeper level, a spectrum of sentiments are also transmitted. Because they are shared, they allow us to participate, to accept, and to believe. Without them, personal relations and collective effort would be impossible. All this is culture, and each new generation receives it enriched by the efforts and the imagination of those who went before. As each generation is shaped within a culture, it in turn helps enrich that culture. Our own culture belongs to us. It is the one to which we have exclusive access. History has defined who we are by specifying who belongs and who does not, and when one stops belonging to the social universe that is the heir, depository, and legitimate owner of our own culture. Each group establishes the limits and the norms. There are ways to join and ways to be accepted. There are also ways of losing one's membership. This is what is expressed in cultural identity. To know and look upon oneself as a member of a group and to be recognized as such by other members and outsiders means to form part of a society that has as its exclusive patrimony its own culture. The individual benefits from his or her culture and has decision-making rights according to the norms, rights, and privileges one's culture establishes in that change over time, all of which are recognized as group membership or membership in a unique different, specific group. From this perspective, we can better understand what it means to belong to an ethnic group. We all necessarily belong to a defined society, large or small, but one that always has boundaries, membership rules, and a store of culture that is considered exclusive and its own. The Indian does not define himself in terms of a series of external cultural traits dress, language, customs, and so on, that make him different in the eyes of outsiders. Rather, he defines himself as belonging to an organized collectivity, a group, a society, a village that possesses a cultural heritage formed and transmitted through history by successive generations. In relation to one's own culture, one knows and feels oneself to be Maya, Purepecha, Sedi, or Huastec. In the specific case of Indian peoples of Mexico, there is another historical condition that is necessary for understanding their basic characteristics and current situation. For 500 years, these people have been the colonized. Colonial domination has had profound effects in every area of indigenous life. It has constrained cultural development, imposed foreign traits, dispossessed people of resources and cultural elements that form part of their historical historical patrimony. Colonial domination provoked various forms of resistance but always tried by any means to ensure the subjugation of those colonized. It was most effective when it was able to convince the colonized of their own inferiority.
Throughout these pages, there will be continual reference to the process of colonial domination. I do not wish to repeat myself unnecessarily, but rather to constantly and necessarily place Indian peoples in the social context within which their history has taken place from five centuries ago up until the present. The preceding reflections should make it easier to understand the difficulties of taking any census of the indigenous population and the inadequacy of the available figures. To make sense, it would be necessary to employ criteria of social group membership and not simply sum up individual characteristics. An estimate of the Indian population of Mexico as being between 8 and 10 million seems reasonable. This would represent 10 to 12.5 percent of the total population. Remember that we are speaking of individuals who maintain their membership in a local group. The group it's identifies itself as different from others because it has a common and exclusive cultural patrimony. Not counted in this figure are other individuals and groups who have lost their sense of ethnic identity, although they conserve a way of life that is basically Mesoamerican. How many Indian cultures exist in Mexico currently? This question cannot be answered precisely either, for reasons that are quickly noted here, but that will be explained later. First, the identification of cultures in terms of the languages they speak is not sufficient. In general, it is estimated that there are 56 surviving Indian languages, but some scholars claim there are many more and argue in some cases that different dialects are in reality different languages. Besides, although speaking a common language is one of the principal requirements for constituting an ethnic group, it is not necessarily true that all the speakers of a language form a single ethnic unit. This means that detailed information on the number of languages spoken does not in itself resolve the problem of how many cultures exist. The basic problem is not linguistic. Colonial domination, as we will see in some detail, tried to systematically destroy the broader levels of existing social organization, which included vast populations occupying broad territories. It insisted on reducing indigenous life exclusively to the local community level. This atomization of the original Indian peoples has affected the course of Mesoamerican civilization. It has reinforced local identity to the detriment of the broader social identities characteristic of Indian social organization before the European invasion. Thus, current identity should be understood as the result of the colonization process and not simply as diverse local communities, each of which constitutes a distinct people or culture. I will return to this point. In spite of the foregoing comments, it is possible to identify contrasting situations that indicate the different demographic conditions characteristic of Mexico's Indian peoples. For example, it is estimated that the Maya of the Yucatan Peninsula have a population of more than 700,000. They occupy a continuous territory, speak the same language, the local dialects never prevent mutual communications in Yucatec Maya, and to a large degree, share the same culture and cultural matrix. Thus, we can speak of the Maya people and Maya culture. The problem is different with the more than 300,000 Zapotecs. They occupy different territories, the mountains of Oaxaca, the central valleys, and the isthmus of Tehuantepec. Speak dialects of the language whose most distant representatives are mutually unintelligible and, pres and present very striking cultural differences. Here, we must speak of a historical people and culture whose internal diversity has been accentuated by colonial domination. But one must understand that many Indian peoples are of nowhere near the demographic magnitude of the Maya, the Nahua, the Zapotecs, the Purepecha, or the Mixtecs. About 20 ethnic groups have fewer than 10,000 members, and half of those have fewer than 1,000. These are the dramatic cases of cultures at risk of extinction besieged by the unseasoned action of ethnocidal forces. It is easy to understand that this diversity of situations is reflected also in the characteristics that each culture has been able to maintain and elaborate. In spite of their differences, it is possible to present an outline of Indian cultures that brings to light their essential characteristics over and above their individual differences.
A Profile of Indigenous Culture Each of the Indian cultures of Mexico has a distinctive cultural profile that is the result of a particular history whose beginnings date to remote times. At first glance, with this mosaic of different peoples, it seems difficult to make valid generalizations. Nevertheless, a careful comparison of different Indian cultures discovers similarities and correspondences beyond their particular traits. This should not be surprising if one keeps in mind two basic facts. First, is the existence of a common civilization in which all Mesoamerican peoples participated and which also influenced the nomadic groups to the north. This civilization is the background, the common cultural heritage of each people. Second, the common experience of colonial domination produced similar effects, even though in some cases the definitive subjugation may have occurred centuries apart. In fact, some people were subjugated or pacified only in the first decade of this century. The territorial distribution of the Indian population shows a greater concentration in areas that had achieved notable cultural development before the European invasion. It is not a perfect correspondence because diverse factors have influenced the original distribution since the beginning of the colonial period. The devastating decline in population during the 16th century, caused by previously unknown diseases, wars, and the hard conditions of forced labor, led to the disappearance of entire peoples and the depopulation of formerly inhabited sites. The seizure of their lands and their stubborn desire to remain free drove many groups into inhospitable regions quite different from their original homelands, the sorts of areas that Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran has quite accurately called refuge regions. Greed for land and demand for forced labor were perennial forces, and their effects were felt with renewed intensity in the 19th century altering once more the distribution of the Indian population in much of the country. In many regions, the Indian population effectively disappeared. In some cases, it was expelled. In others, exterminated, as was the case with the great Chichimeca of the arid north. Most frequently, it was subjected to conditions that made continuity as a culturally different people impossible. The last process, de-Indianization, has been called mixture or mestizaje, but it really was and is ethnocide. We will return to it later. Today, the population recognized as Indian is distributed unequally in the national territory. The central, southern, and southeastern regions are home to the largest groups and contain vast regions in which the Indians are the majority, particularly in comparison with the rest of the rural population. Indian communities are situated in diverse ecological zones from the humid tropical forests to the semi-arid plateaus more than 6,600 feet or 2,000 meters above sea level. Areas of steep mountain slopes where making a living is difficult are frequently isolated refuge regions whose only occupants are Indians. Few Indian communities are on the coasts. Mesoamerican civilization is more at home along the rivers and lakes in the mountains and fertile valleys although it has sometimes adapted to semi-arid conditions. The colonial occupation of the territory, the gradual and variable growth of what was the useful Mexico to the colonizers, has in most regions interrupted the original contiguity of the indigenous territories. Physical space has been fragmented as a consequence of the expropriation of Indian lands, policies of dividing the land for administrative purposes, the establishment of non-Indian cities and enterprises, networks of roads, and the construction of large pro public projects, excuse me. And nevertheless, in certain zones, for example, among the Maya of Yucatan, territorial continuity survives. Other groups, however, have become enclaves within their own territories, which are now occupied by non-Indian Mexico. The initial impression one gains from a rapid tour through any Indian region is a of a rural peasant world composed of communities that seem similar to one another. The people are different from those in the cities, although not absent in them. The basic productive activity of the Indian communities is agriculture. There are many systems of cultivation, depending on soil types, topographic relief, the yearly rainfall, average temperatures, and of course, the cultural traditions represented. 
These systems always seek the optimum utilization of the local resources and the best adaptation to the, lo the local conditions, starting from the system of knowledge, technology, social organization of work, and the preferences and values of the group. The popular image of Indian agriculture portrays it as primitive and of low productivity. Quite to the contrary, however, we can observe a situation that offers a varied and rich panorama. The first general characteristic of Indian agriculture is that several different products are raised simultaneously on the same plot. The best known example is the classic milpa, in which corn, beans, squash, and chilies are grown together. Actually, the number of crops grown together is usually larger. In some cases, as among the Huastec of northern Veracruz, the list of things grown in the milpa includes root crops, tubers, cereal grains, agaves, vegetables, and fruits. In many areas of the humid tropics, a system of shade-producing zones is utilized, which depends on the height of each cultivated species, to best utilize the available solar energy and increase the variety of crops grown. In other areas, the diversification of cultivated crops is achieved by complementing the basic products of the milpa with many others grown in small quantities on a piece of land next to the living quarters. In this case, it is usually the women who cultivate the family garden while the men work in the milpa. It is important to note that the diversification of agricultural products, which implies different harvests at different seasons, plays an important role in the diet available in indigenous communities. To evaluate the Mesoamerican diet, one cannot simply quantify the calories or protein consumed in any particular day or week. Rather, one must take into account the annual cycle, in which the absence of a certain nutrients in a given period is compensated by their abundance in others. The dietary cycle also includes meals during fiestas, some which occur on obligatory established days, and others of which occur irregularly, on the occasion of baptisms, weddings, and house construction celebrations. Finally, one must not lose sight of the fact that the indigenous diet also includes a great variety of insects and animals available in different seasons, which provide nutrients in the annual cycle. An agricultural system that continues in use in the lake regions of the Valley of Mexico is the cultivation of chinampas. The chinampas utilize shallow lake waters, and along their banks, parcels of farmland are constructed. These parcels, the chinampas themselves, remain con constantly damp and are systems that are highly productive for horticulture. The tools used in Indian agriculture are usually simple and frequently manufactured in the communities themselves. For planting on steep or rocky lands, either in espeque, a stick with a fire-hardened point, or nasada, a large curved hoe, is used. On flat lands, a wooden plow is used. Along with these basic instruments, the machete, the sickle, a knife for husking the ears of corn, and little else are used. There are more complex Indian agricultural systems in which water is controlled by dams and canals. There are also ways of cultivating hillsides and avoiding soil erosion through the construction of rock terraces or magawe hedges. Altogether, agricultural technology is far from primitive in spite of the elementary tools used. It implies putting into practice a complex variety of knowledge that is the accumulation of long-term experience. This knowledge includes knowing the characteristics of the soils, selecting compatible varieties of plants, cultivating each one according to its special regiments, following the correct calendar of activities, fighting pests, and carrying out an infinity of tasks necessary to obtain a good harvest. Agriculture in Indian communities is intimately related to activities other than cultivating the earth. They form a complex that should be understood as a whole. Use of the natural world includes not only agriculture, but also the gathering of wild plant foods, hunting, fishing where it is possible, and the raising of domestic animals. All these tasks imply a great range of knowledge, abilities, and practices that acquire unity and coherence through a particular conception of nature and the relation of humankind to it. In analyzing Indian cultures, it is frequently difficult to establish the boundaries between what is economic and what is social. It is also difficult to separate what is believed from what is known, myth from historical memory and explanation, and ritual from acts whose practical efficacy has been proven time and again for generations. Therefore, along what we would call solid empirical knowledge, 
We find ritual practices and beliefs that, in our effort to adjust indigenous cultural reality to our own categories, we would call magical. Our categories of Western origin do not exist in these cultures. In Indian cultures, the conception of the world, of nature and humankind, makes quite different kinds of actions seem equally necessary. For example, a propitiatory ceremony for a good growing season may be as important as the proper selection of seeds for planting. There is a unity of human beings and the natural world, which is the reference point for human knowledge and abilities as well as for work, the specific way of obtaining sustenance. This unity is also present in human plans, in the capacity for imagining as well as observing nature, in the willingness to have dialogue with it, in human fears and hopes faced with forces beyond human control. Of course, this occurs in all cultures, but in Western culture there is an effort to separate and specialize in distinct aspects of a unitary reality. The poet eulogizes the moon, but the astronomer studies it. The painter recreates the forms and colors of the countryside, while the agronomist understands soils. The mystic prays. There is no way in Western logic of unifying all these things in a common understanding, as does the Indian. It is difficult to comprehend many characteristics of Mesoamerican civilization if one does not take into account one of its most profound dimensions, the conception of the natural world and the human being's place in the cosmos. In this civilization, unlike that of the West, the natural world is not seen as an enemy. Neither is it assumed that greater human self-realization is achieved through greater separation from nature. To the contrary, a person's condition as part of the cosmic order is recognized and the aspiration is towards permanent integration, which can be achieved only through a harmonious relationship with the rest of the natural world. By obeying the principles of the universal order, human beings fulfill themselves and meet their transcendent destiny. Thus, we can see that work, the effort applied to obtain from nature that which humans need, has a differing meaning from its meaning in Western civilization. It is not a punishment, but a method of harmonious adjustment to the cosmic order. A positive relationship with nature should be achieved on all levels, not just the purely material one of physical labor. For that reason, it is impossible to separate ritual from physical effort, empirical knowledge from the myth that provides its full meaning within the Mesoamerican cosmic vision. This does not mean that an absence of practical considerations nor an ignorance of benefits and advantages. Rather, they are located in a different context. There is a practical logic in the distribution of work time and in the diversification of activities. However, that logic becomes evident only if one understands the ultimate objectives of productive activity and the necessities it satisfies. Indian cultures tend towards self-sufficiency. This tendency is seen at various levels, family, lineage, barrio, and community. Self-sufficiency today is never an absolute reality, but it is a general, well-defined orientation. The sheep provide manure, which fertilizes the land. Families therefore want to have sheep even though they rarely eat them or sell them. The turkey, which is needed for the meal during the fiesta, for the rituals of marriage, for house construction, or for the banquet I may give as a mayor the mole, is raised in the household rather than bought. And within the community are those who know how to deal with other necessities, the midwife, the bone setter, the herbalist, the blacksmith, the musician. The community is an intricate web of general knowledge, of diversified activities, and of indispensable specializations that allow life to be lived with autonomy. The logic of self-sufficiency governs many actions. For this reason, it is incorrect to look at Indian agriculture in terms of the theoretical value of raising only cotton or sunflowers or tomatoes instead of a diversified milpa. Such speculations also ignore exhausted soils, sharp drops in market prices, voracious intermediaries, technological and financial dependence, and many other problems that have brought ruin to an endless number of modernization and agricultural development projects. What does the self-sufficient Indian type of economy have to offer? Above all, it offers basic security, a broader margin of subsistence in difficult years, even though one has only what is really indispensable.
Various crops, together with wild plant gathering, hunting, fishing, and the raising of domestic animals, intermix with some sort of handicraft production, pottery, textiles, basketry, and many other products, and the generalized capacity for other sorts of work such as construction and maintenance all offer a broad spectrum of possibilities that can be altered or combined according to the circumstances. No one of these possibilities alone, given the conditions of indigenous communities today, assures survival. Together, however, they offer an acceptable margin of security. For this multiple strategy to succeed, each activity must be on a small scale, producing what is necessary and nothing else. This fact explains another general characteristic of the Indian economy, its low level of surplus and its low level of accumulation. These characteristics, from the point of view of those who argue for capitalist development in the national economy, have been repeatedly pointed out as scandalous limitations. The Indians do not buy, or they buy very little. They do not generate capital, and they do not invest. We will analyze this question later. Another result of an economy oriented towards self-sufficiency is that it both requires and provides the opportunity for developing individual ab abilities in many diverse activities. Contrast this with our own world, headed toward a greater and more fragmented specialization each day. Witness the specialist who knows more and more about less and less. The Indian in a traditional community has to know what is necessary to know about many different things and develop abilities for many different tasks. And he or she learns differently, not in school, but through living, through contact with others, and through doing the work itself. Exercising or broadening one's abilities is the result of a process that cannot be distinguished from life itself. There is no special time or place for learning what needs to be known. One observes, practices, asks questions, and listens at whatever time and wherever one may be. Some profound satisfaction must reside in knowing one is capable, through one's own efforts, of solving so many common daily problems and attending to basic needs. There are also effects on the way work is organized. The family is usually extended, composed of various generations who live under the authority of the head of the family, the grandfather or the great-grandfather of the smallest ones. It functions as an economic unit. There is a division of labor between men and women whose norms are inculcated in children from an early age. There are norms of cooperation and participation which are generally based on reciprocity. There is an intense family home life based on shared or complementary work, on ritual and celebration, on the sharing of domestic space. Space is conceived more in terms of continuous collective relationships than in terms of privacy. The problems and joys of work are more fully shared because their meaning and consequences are understood by everyone on the basis of their own experiences. Relations within the family clearly reflect its nature as a production and consumption unit. However, the family's economic function is obviously not its only one, and economic activists in themselves do not indicate the richness and the importance of domestic life. The family unit, occupant of the domestic space, is the most secure place for reproducing the culture of the Indian community. The woman's role is basic. It is her job to rear the children and pass on to her daughters all the cultural elements that will allow them to perform adequately as women. To a large extent, she is the primary link for the continuity of the language itself and the repository of norms and values that are vital within the Mesoamerican cultural matrix. Her role is recognized socially and within the family. In the communities that have preserved their own cultures to the largest degree, the woman participates more actively and on an equal footing with men, not only in domestic affairs, but also in decisions affecting the community. One of the traits frequently noted by those who study indigenous life is parents' benevolent and respectful treatment of children. Physical punishment is rarely used to correct children. Neither are children restricted from participating in a family discussion. There is a broad tolerance for premarital sexual relations that even includes, in some groups, acceptance of homosexual relations during adolescence. Communication between grandparents and grandchildren has a privileged place and provides a social space for making good use of the experience of the elderly. Between the family and the community exist other levels of social organization that also fulfill economic functions. For example, kinship relations beyond those of the extended family can be used to organize cooperation. A larger number of individuals can thus be mobilized for certain tasks 
that the domestic unit cannot do for itself. Cooperation may be given in the form of labor at harvest time or for the construction of a house. It may also be given in the form of cash, for a marriage celebration, for a wake and burial, or for fulfillment of ceremonial obligations attached to holding public office in the community. Cooperation is always based on reciprocity. Today for you, tomorrow for me. In many cases, each person keeps an exact record of what he has given to other members of the lineage and what he in turn has received from each of them. The barrio, or the paraje in some regions, is another unit of organization that functions in some economic activities. The members of a barrio may have to meet their labor obligations for some public work. They sometimes have the collective responsibility of cultivating a parcel of land to cover the expenses of the church or school, the cleaning and care of the chapel, or the collaboration in some way towards the expenses of the local fiestas. When the population lives in a dispersed fashion, the center may have only a few permanent inhabitants, but it is used periodically for meetings of a ritual, commercial, or administrative nature. In these cases, the maintenance and care of the public installations is organized by paraje, either in rotating fashion or by permanently assigning certain tasks to each of them. A trait that deserves special mention is the social structure of the Indian communities is endogamy, that is the tendency for marriages between members of the same community. On occasion, endogamy is an explicit norm in customary law. Whoever violates it loses communal rights and privileges. More frequently, it is an implicit norm, and compliance is achieved through social pressure. In either case, endogamous marriage is an incustom, is a custom rather that contributes in an important way to the maintenance and continuity of the Indian community insofar as it impedes the incorporation of, quote, the others, end quote, into the social universe of the group. It also contributes to the reproduction of community culture by guaranteeing that the new couple shares it. Settlement patterns vary. There are dispersed communities already mentioned, in which houses are scattered among the cultivated fields and are separated by the considerable distances. Others are centralized communities with contiguous houses lining streets and paths, but always with gardens and small household milpas among them. And there are communities of an intermediate order in which one can identify an inhabited center that disperses toward its margins. In all cases, the community has one set of authorities who are recognized by all. These central authorities have the responsibility of organizing and supervising the communal work projects. Tequio, Fajina, and Fatiga are some of the regional names for this form of collective work in which all adult men are obliged to participate. Such tequios are used for public work, such as the construction and maintenance of the roads, the, bu the building of schools, and the repair of churches, and other public buildings. Generally, a married man is considered an ad adult regardless of his age. Women are not excluded. They prepare the food to be distributed among the Ditequio participants. The occasions for cooperative or collective work carry with them a fiesta spirit, an atmosphere of social sharing between the members of a lineage, of a barrio, or of the entire community. This is an element that encourages participation and reinforces the solidarity of these groups. Thus, one activity can bring together in an inseparable manner social, symbolic, and entertainment functions, as well as purely economic ones. The notion of salary is foreign to a large part of the work oriented towards self-sufficiency. Work is not paid, it is returned. One acquires the obligation of doing for others what they did for you when the appropriate time arrives. Communal work is an implicit obligation of being part of a community. It is a universal obligation without distinction. Here, sir, when someone doesn't go, he must pay someone else to work for him. Taken together, these forms of cooperative work organize the efforts and abilities of the community according to the priorities that are decided by the community itself or by its recognized authorities. The rhythms and requirements of basic agricultural tasks have to be taken into account of course, as does the fact that the systems of social organization used, family, lineage, barrio, community, have many other functions as well. All this, together with the worldview of each Indian culture, creates a conception of work that is necessarily different from that of capitalist societies or of Western civilization in general. We will come back to this point. 
It has already been mentioned that complete self-sufficiency is never achieved today. Interchanges occur in different forms and of different intensities. People come together in a weekly market, which may be in the barrio itself, in the center of the community, or in the mestizo city that controls the region. Even today in some zones, there is direct interchange of products or barter without the use of money. In general, however, all things have a price and are bought and sold with money. But the people of the Indian communities do not go to the weekly market only as buyers and sellers. Basically, they go to interchange, even though the process may require a brief monetary intervention. They exchange a small quantity of their own agricultural or handicraft products for things they need that they do not produce themselves. In a later chapter, we will describe how this relationship of exchange is transformed when commerce is no longer between members of Indian communities, but rather through the intervention of the capitalist mercantile system. Interchange does not happen only at the weekly market. In vast regions of Mexico, there is a system of annual fairs. These are visited regularly by inhabitants of very distant zones whose products are different. In this way, the movement of products from the coast and the lowlands towards the high plateau is organized and vice versa. In some cases, there are huge fairs which, in the course of a week, receive hundreds of thousands of visitors, including merchants, intermediaries, and primary producers. The main motive is religious. The fiesta of a venerated sacred image whose fame is regional or national. Going to the fair, however, simultaneously accomplishes various functions. One fulfills a promise to a saint or requests a divine favor. One enjoys the dances, the music, and the fireworks. One sees acquaintances who are encountered each year, exchanges news and the friendly drink with them. One visits the doctor. Things are bought and sold. In short, one lives a time out from the normal work year's activities. Many fairs have been celebrated for centuries in the same places. Though their presence and through ceremonial activities, people from the same distant villages reconfirm particular relationships with other villages that probably predate the European invasion. The vast movement of products assembled from diverse regions for annual interchange in the great fairs includes the circulation of goods manufactured by specialized communities. Although the cultivation of the land is the economic base of Indian communities, and although in most cases there also exist handicraft activities on a domestic scale, there are also communities that have specialized in producing certain kinds of objects for the market. Some are handicrafts of long tradition in which pre-Hispanic technology has varied little over the last five centuries and whose styles and decoration are practically the same. For example, there are large pottery bowls made without a wheel and fired under large stacks of firewood, blouses of coyuchil or a native cotton, woven and embroidered onto a backstrap loom, wooden objects lacquered with techniques practiced before the European invasion, and paper made from the chopped bark of trees. Other handicrafts, of course, have suffered profound modifications from the technology, needs, and tastes introduced by the invaders. Some are also the result of much more recent innovations. But based upon old artistic traditions, such as the paintings on amate or bark paper. In any case, the frequent handicraft specialization of the communities does not contradict a basic orientation of the Indian economy towards self-sufficiency. Handicraft production does not replace the agricultural activity of the community, but it does reinforce the capacity for interchange, which becomes yet another resource in a system of diversified production. The relative specialization of some communities can also be understood as a strategy contributing to the self-sufficiency of the broader Indian world beyond the local community. This holds true if one thinks of products whose principal market is other than Indian communities. Property rights, adjudication, and the use of productive resources of the Indian community also reflect the basic orientation of economic activity. Land, because of its fundamental importance, provides the best example. In principle, land is not private but rather communal property, and mechanisms exist to assign to each family head parcels of land. These can be used by the same person for many years and even be passed to his descendants. However, they may also revert to the community and be assigned to others according to the established norms. The forests and mountains, which cannot be used for agriculture, are also communal property and all community members may use them to obtain what they need. In general, even plots that are recognized as private property are subject to certain limitations. For instance, 
They may only be sold to another member of the community, not to an outsider. Land is not conceived of as just marketable good. There is a much deeper connection with the land. It is an indispensable productive resource that forms part of an inherited culture. It is the land of the ancestors in which they are now resting. There, in that defined space, various superior forces also manifest themselves. Some are positive, but others are malevolent and must be propitiated. There are also sacred sites and reference points and dangers. Land is a living being that reacts to human conduct. For that reason, the relationship with it is not purely mechanical, but rather is symbolically established through innumerable rituals. The relationship is also expressed in myths and legends. Frequently, people's image of the earth itself has reference to their particular territory, which occupies the center of the universe. Among displaced communities, the collective memory of the original territory and the aspiration to recover it remain, even when the people now have other lands on which to live. Group and territory, a defined group in a specific territory, form an inseparable unit in Indian cultures. Later, we will examine the fortunes of Indian territory throughout history and the problems presented today. It is in relation to common history slash territory and territory slash culture that the group that aspires to self-sufficiency defines itself. We ourselves, those of such and such a place, or of such and such a group, since land and community are synonymous here, do such and such things or make these objects or have these customs. The social fabric of an Indian community includes a more complicated and varied culture weft than one appreciates at first glance. The variety of occupations, specialized jobs, and specialized knowledge is surprising. Medicine, for example, includes on one hand general knowledge and practices that are used within the household for common problems. On the other hand, it includes diverse specialists who preserve ancestral traditions used to attend to more severe illnesses. In Indian cultures, many illnesses are explained by the intervention of superior forces. These forces act to punish conduct considered unacceptable because it constitutes a transgression of norms ensuring harmony between human beings and between humans and the universe. Thus, treatment may include propitiatory ceremonies and rites prescribed by tradition. There is also a profound knowledge of the therapeutic properties of herbs and other products, however, which results from their cumulative systematic use in each particular culture. There is also a profound knowledge of the therapeutic properties of herbs and other products, however, which results from their cumulative systematic use in each particular culture. The therapeutic effect of medicinal products is also reinforced by using them within a symbolic and emotional context that has cultural meaning. A multiple therapy exists that recognizes the psychosomatic character of many ailments and attends physical problems as much as spiritual ones. The Indian doctor is a specialist who diagnoses and prescribes on the basis of natural bodily symptoms, but who interprets them within a framework of broad symbolic significance. In consequence, he makes use of a large number of cultural elements to restore integral health or, when necessary, to adequately prepare for approaching death. Here again in the field of medicine, it is impossible to establish strict boundaries between social life and other areas of thought. Human conduct conditions health. The knowledge of the curative properties of plants forms part of the total conception of nature and is expressed with the corresponding symbolism. What we call religion and what we call medicine are intertwined in many ways so that the distinction is erased. Indian communities count on other specialists to carry out necessary tasks beyond the general competence of everyone. There are people who are better than others at building houses, making agricultural implements, and making ceramic or wooden objects. There are also specialists in managing the weather, who drive away storms and bring the good rains. There are singers of prayers for the dead and dance masters for the fiestas. There are musicians, storytellers, and old people who remember history. There is no room here for even a summary description of these and many other activities. The example of medicine must serve to point out that each specialty in an Indian community must be understood within the context of its culture. It is difficult and usually fruitless to isolate, to analyze, and to evaluate each activity alone, 
separated from the other tasks and concepts that form an integral communal life. Taken together, they create the capacity for each group's self-sufficiency. The mechanical transference of terms we customarily apply, such as specialist or professional, forms an obstacle to understanding life in an indigenous community. The bone setter does not cease being a peasant farmer and he may also be a musician. This year he may be responsible for the virgin as Mayordomo, besides participating in the regular communal work projects, tequios, like everyone else. A brief description of communal government may help complete this picture of Indian communities. Authority in Indian villages accompanies social prestige, which is acquired throughout life by demonstrating the capacity for community service. In the realm of public life, one gives community service by participating in a system of public posts, or cargos. In all groups, a hierarchy of cargos, most of them annual, constitutes the communal government. In some cases, the fulfillment of cargos is voluntary, with those who aspire to them volunteering to the appropriate authorities. In other cases, the cargos are obligatory and are filled by designation or by election. One must work up the hierarchy beginning with the lowest cargos. Very young men or adolescents fill the lowest posts, called topiles in many communities, obeying the directions of those who occupy higher ranks. Each cargo has defined obligations. As one ascends from the hierarchy, the public commitment increases in terms of both the time that must be spent and the expenses required of the cargo holder. A mayordomo, for example, is responsible for the organization of the annual fiesta dedicated to one of the images that are communally venerated. He must pay the expenses of the fiesta. These will include, at a minimum, payment for musicians, religious services, food and drink for all who attend, for clothes and adornments for the sacred image, and for rockets and fireworks. To meet these expenses, which are heavy given the low income levels, the Mayordomo resorts to various expedients. expedients. He raises household animals, which will be consumed or sold for the fiesta. He asks for cooperation from members of his lineage, building upon expectations of reciprocity for past or future contributions. He sells his own labor, usually outside the community, for some period of time. He acquires debts and saves what he can. On these occasions, the ties of solidarity within Indian communities are clear, because the prestige of the Meyer Domo is also the prestige of the family and the lineage and the barrio. The spending on these ritual occasions has been called sumptuary expense. The reasons for investing resources in this manner have been explained in terms of a particular economic modality, the economic of prestige. For many, it seems irrational, another proof of the Indian's lack of ability, spending on useless fiestas when he could productively invest to increase his capital. But perhaps there is a better explanation. The cargo system formalizes the authority of the community, which is simultaneously civil, religious, and moral. The three aspects are indissolubly linked, and the author is acquired progressively. When an individual has occupied all the cargos in the hierarchy, including the highest, generally called Mayordomo, he enters the group of principales, in these men resides the maximum authority of the community. This means that to acquire a recognized position, one must demonstrate for years a will and a capacity for public service, along with conduct that conforms to the norms and expectations defined by the cultural group. To earn recognized legitimate authority implies investing time and resources throughout most of one's life to fulfill functions that the community considers necessary. As one ascends in the hierarchy, one gains experience. Thus, those who have assembled through the hierarchy are those who know how public affairs should be conducted, those who can guarantee continuity and confront collective contingencies. Their advice is a proven value, and even in the area of personal life, it is evaluated in the light of a career of a recognized merit. The organization of government briefly sketched above presupposes the convergence of individual, will, and conduct toward joint goals. Such a convergence can be achieved only if individuals share common aspirations and values. Personal and family sacrifices must be made to carry out a community cargo, and the only return is public consideration. The prestige is manifested in ritualized deference, but it implies no material benefit of any significance. Such sacrifices indicate an orientation toward life that is difficult to comprehend from the individualistic acquisitive perspective 
of modern capitalist society. Why do people behave in this way? Why is such conduct accepted and rewarded? Of course, there are social pressure mechanisms that help enforce proper conduct. These include falling into disrepute and suffering from the negative opinions of others, exposure to ridicule, and families' and authorities' insistence on proper behavior. Whoever accumulates as an individual, instead of spending toward the sumptuary expenses of a cargo as prescribed by the group, loses prestige and authority instead of gaining them. Conflict may reach the point of forcing someone to leave the community. To a large extent, this explains what happens in the case of those who convert to Protestantism and refuse to participate in the system of traditional government. Nevertheless, social pressure itself requires some explanation. It is found in the fact that participation is an indispensable condition for being recognized and admitted as a member of the group. And it is the group that is the exclusive repository of the cultural patrimony that has been inherited. To gain legitimate access to the cultural patrimony and to be able to participate in decisions about it, one must be a member of the group. To be a member, thus closing the circle, one must prove that he accepts the collective norms. Participation in the cargo system, with all it implies in terms of fundamental orientation toward life, is one of the basic norms that identify as group members. This form of organization is so important that in many cases, immigrants return annually to their community to comply with their obligations in order not to lose their rights as group members. The correspondence between different aspects of Indian life that have been described so far is apparent. The orientation of production towards self-sufficiency is congruent with the economy of prestige. Both tend to equalize material levels of life, preventing the growth of wealth differences. The ties of family and neighborhood solidarity based on reciprocity have the same effect as do the ways of acquiring authority. Communal property rights and the limitations imposed on private landholding are also congruent with the system. The image outlined is of a society that tries to take care of itself through diversified use of all the resources at its disposal and under its control. It organizes work capacity in such a way as to guarantee available labor according to the magnitude of the task at hand. It puts into play a complex web of loyalties and solidarity that results from kinship and not from the work relationship itself. Full individual development is realized through community service, and the reward is prestige and authority. It is a way of life that offers and requires the development of multiple capacities on the part of each individual. All this is expressed and justified in the realm of ideas through a transcendent vision of humankind in the universe. In this conception, Nature, of which humans are a part, is governed by a cosmic order to which all beings must adapt. For this reason, humans do not confront the natural world. It is not an enemy or an object to be dominated, but, rather, an immediate encompassing reality, and human life must be in harmony with it. Work is, then, a way of relating to the natural world, and the relationship, as between humans, is reciprocal. Thus, service to the community, in whatever spirit is offered, is also recognized as work. The same principles of universal order seem to be found in these systems for classifying the natural world. Indian classifications of the plant world, to the extent that they have been studied, frequently employ terms that come from an ancestral way of conceiving the world. Frequently in botanical nomenclature, certain characteristics of plants are associated with the colors of the different directions of the universe, which in turn correspond to deities linked to human destiny. The classification principles are also applied as far as is known to distinguish the parts, organs, and elements of the human body. The classification principles thus connect with conceptions about health and illness and with therapeutic practices and their corresponding rituals. There is much yet to be learned in this area because research has been limited. Nevertheless, it is clear that collective representations about life, the universe, and fundamental human problems are, exist. They ideologically sustain and make coherent the social and cultural practices of Indian communities. The supernatural world, in this vision of the cosmos, plays a role of primary importance. The forces beyond human control, in order to be comprehensible, are embodied in a broad repertory of symbolic beings. These include the owners of springs and hills and caves, the rulers of the rain and the lightning, the animal whose life and fortune is indissolubly linked to the life and fortune of each newborn human, the winds and the earth itself. 
The relationship with the natural world is symbolized through a ceremonial intended to propitiate the supernatural entities that represent it. This is a coherent way of symbolically expressing human participation in the fundamental and indivisible unity of the universe to which we belong. Unity with the cosmos is also expressed in another transcendent dimension, time. As opposed to Western conception, time in Mesoamerican civilization is circular, not linear. The universe proceeds through a succession of cycles that, although not identical, pass through the same stages in an unending spiral. When one cycle ends, a similar one begins. Humans fulfill their own cycle, which is in harmony with the other cycles of the universe. This necessary harmony is expressed in the rituals of the agricultural calendar that symbolize the renewal of life, in which humans must participate. Also, as we will see later, the circular conception of time is present in the conceptions of history. The liberty of the past, the golden age before colonial domination, is not a dead past, lost forever, but the basis of hope, because in the cycle of time that age will come again. I want to be clear about several questions raised to the selective synthesis of Indian culture that I have presented in this section. In the first place, I want to underline that it is selective. I have not presented an ethnographic summary of all the traits of Indian culture. I have selected only certain aspects that are especially pertinent for giving a vision that clarifies what I believe to be the fundamental determining characteristics of Mesoamerican culture. In the second place, in this synthesis, I have described traits that are common to the diverse indigenous cultures of Mexico. Nevertheless, these cultures are not completely uniform. In comparing different Indian cultures, notable differences will be found. The particular form in which the general traits I have mentioned occur varies a great deal. And distinctive elements will be found that give to each other its particular profile. In my opinion, such variations, however important they may be for a complete understanding of each culture, are not enough to call into question the common scheme outlined above. Unity exists within diversity as a result of membership in a common civilization. Finally, and most important, this panorama of Indian culture takes into account only part of the contemporary reality of the Indian communities. Contemporary reality is much more complex, and it is contradictory. Traditional forms of life coexist in conflict with new ones. Coherence is cracked and broken in the presence of new necessities, other peoples, and other objects. The spears of self-sufficiency are reduced, and all that remain are besieged bastions. Some parents prefer that their children not speak the language of their ancestors. Immigration increases. In the face of these patent realities, of what value is the image of Indian culture presented in these pages? I discuss these and other problems that characterize the contemporary situation of Indian peoples in the second part of this book. Here, my intention has been to describe the autonomous culture of the Indian peoples, that which is based on its cultural heritage and over which it exercises control and makes decisions. It is from that autonomous culture and the elements that compose it material items, organization, knowledge, symbolic, and emotional elements that each group confronts new situations and changes in the surrounding world. Through its autonomous culture, it establishes relationships with the new world, adapting to new circumstances, resisting in order to prove its social spaces in all areas of life, appropriating foreign culture elements that prove useful and compatible. It events new solutions and ideas and strategies of accommodation that allowed the group to survive as a different, distinguishable collectivity whose members have access to their own common cultural patrimony. This is only a part of contemporary reality, but within this part resides the reason for the existence as Indian peoples. This concludes chapter two.